Deck check. I like it. Good morning. This is our eighth installment for the Miracles and Parables of Jesus class. If you were looking for something else, now's your time to exit. Um, we are currently on our third lesson about miracles of physical healing. And we'll be talking about some pretty interesting stories of miracles that Jesus performed today. Uh, let's begin with a prayer. Our dear God, we thank you so much for giving us this time to be together, to put a pause in our week and to meet here and worship your name, and now to study the acts, the deeds, and the words and teachings of your son. Please help us to glean what we need to know most and to hold fast to everything as we learn more about your will for us through him. These things we ask and pray through his name. Amen. Okay, we'll be talking about, uh, like I said, physical acts of healing, and specifically the centurion's servant. We'll be the first we'll talk about. And then the blind and mute demon-possessed man. And some of the old writings, they use the word demoniac, and I had to put it there because it's just such a cool word, demoniac. Um, how many of you have used that word in the last year? Raise your hand. Demoniac. So when you see demoniac, it just means a demon-possessed person. Um, and then two demoniacs of a villa called Gadarene. So we'll talk about these uh, in some detail. Um, at this time, as we know, this is the, the time of the Roman era and the Roman Empire was firmly in control. And this is a scale model of ancient Rome from the first century that's in Rome that you can go visit, pay a ticket, and, and walk around and see everything. And it's pretty amazing. I mean, you can look at, look at the Roman ruins and realize this was a big deal. I know a lot of us, I'm looking across the crowd, I can, I can just pick out a bunch of people I know who have been to Rome. And it's pretty amazing just to see what's left after 2,000 years that's still there. So Rome was a, a big thing, and lots of things came with it. Um, I was just talking to someone that um, had come back from uh, Ireland, was talking about the Roman ruins that they're still discovering throughout the United Kingdom. Um, they'll find a fortress, they'll dig it up and say, hey, it's still intact. It just was covered up with pasture. Or they've got Roman roads that are still being traveled. They've got Roman bridges all through Europe where the Romans traveled and built these wonderful creations. Marvels of engineering, marvels of architecture, marvels of construction. Um, and lots of things along with it that were pretty astounding for that time. And even today in many cases. Speaking of technology engineering or the lack of it I just have two small ears that's what it is I can promise you that I've been to the Pantheon and, and this is a dome structure that was, it's made of concrete there's no reinforcement within it you know when we build a concrete structure we put these iron bars in there rebar to help hold it together and this building doesn't have any metal inside the concrete. It's just concrete. Um, and you look at the engineering of it, it's a, it was built before Christ, um, and it's a magnificent structure to go inside just to see it. But when you look at the cutaway views of it, you think, how did they know to do that? They built the tapering walls, and they used an aggregate that became lighter and lighter as it got to the top. The very top is only four inches thick around that skylight circle. And it's still there. It's been there through how many earthquakes? and It's just amazing. So Rome had a lot going for it. In fact, after the period of the Romans, when they got to the Renaissance era, people didn't know how they built it. They thought it was magic. 
There's all kinds of stories came up about how the Romans built this thing because they had no clue. So it took modern engineering to figure out some of the things they've, they've done, but they still don't know exactly all the details of what they've done to make this last because our concrete doesn't last 2,000 years, right? Theirs does. Despite all this, Rome had some issues around the time of these physical healings that we're going to talk about. Um, the Roman Empire was very expansive. As you know, it was most of the civilized world except for East Asia and Far, East, far, far Asia. A total of 75 million people were Roman citizens, which means about 25% of the world were Roman citizens. That's crazy. It's a very large organization by anyone's standards. And one out of five of those people lived in a city of some kind. They were, this, was, this was not an agrarian um, kind of government. They depended upon all the countries they conquered to be the farmers. And they did a little farming in Italy, but it wasn't enough to support all of this. Uh, Rome had itself about one million people in the city. So that little scale model I showed you was one little sliver of Rome, which went on and on and on. That's a tenth the size of New York. Hard to think about that at the turn of, of, uh, of that first century. And the cities, all the cities, were what the sociologists call a demographic sink. Anybody knows what that means? I didn't know what that meant until I started this study. A demographic sink. Oh, that could be, because there was a, people from all over the Roman Empire. The phrase, the term means that people go in and they don't come out. It's a demographic sink. And the reason for that is that it was, the death rate in Rome was really high, and all the cities were really high. So people went in and they had to be replaced with other people coming in because they died a relatively early Death. Despite having all these modern marvels of Rome at the time, they had plumbing, but it was lead pipes. We don't do that for a good reason. Um, they had some sewage, and they had some things about their sewage that were not very good, too. Um, so it was a problem. Only about half of children actually reached adulthood. High child mortality. And life expectancy, amazingly, I didn't know this, was 22 years. So uh, Rome was not really a place that um, you'd want to be. Dense urban population, poor sanitation, that's a bad recipe for public health issues. And they had many public health issues. Um, epidemics, there were nine recorded, and these I, you could call these pandemics because it was the entire Roman Empire that had smallpox and all kinds of other communicable diseases that went through the entire Roman Empire, wiped out up to a third of the people sometimes. Um, nine major pandemics that happened from 40 B.C. until about 148 B.C. that were recorded. And it wasn't just the poor people. The most famous was uh, Emperor Marcus Aurelius had 14 kids. Only two got out of childhood. So it happened even at the highest levels that... These kind of things happened. When we were there, uh, I didn't know the correlation at the time, but um, there's a bunch of different kinds of specialized swords that Roman soldiers had. Gladiators had all kinds of things that had these Latin names. And uh, the copus sword, the falcata sword, the spatha sword, all the different shapes and so forth. But they were based upon the length of the soldier's arm. And so archaeologists can look at the swords that were found and what the date era that they were, and they can figure out how tall that person was pretty closely. Um, and I was looking at one of these swords in a case, and it said it was based upon the length from here to here, and it was some factor they multiplied. I looked at the sword, and I put my arm beside, and I thought, that was a little dude. It had to be four foot eleven or less. I mean, you know, and this was a, we think about Roman soldiers, you know, they were all small. Because of all these bad health things going on. So this is not a healthy time to be 
living in the greatest empire that the world had ever known. And it was reflected there. So here's the story that we've, this is the, the situation we find ourselves in. Let's begin reading Matthew 8. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. So here's the, the tone, the, the story that's happening. Um, we'll talk about centurions uh, a little bit after we finish this next two verses, three verses. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said to the centurion, go, go. Let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Pretty amazing story. There's a lot woven into this that Jesus' words are going to tell us, though. So let's kind of pick it apart a little bit and talk about it. Um, this happened in the city of Capernaum. We've talked about Capernaum as uh, described by Luke as Jesus' hometown. We know it wasn't his only hometown. He had... Uh, born in, in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, and now he spends a lot of his adult life in Capernaum. Um, we will recall that's on the Sea of Galilee at the northern part. We've talked about that several times. And Capernaum is, uh, for a lot of reasons, was a pretty major town. Besides the fact it was base of operations, it was a border town. So trade coming in from the north on the Via Maris was there. The Jordan River brought trade. It was within the territory of one of the Herods. This is one of the Herod the Great's sons, Antipas. And right next door to another son, Herod Philip. Crossroads at the juncture of all these different things going on. So that's why we find Matthew there collecting taxes, right? And why it was an important place. What about the centurion that's involved here in Capernaum? Centurion. So a century, if you're a, think about years, it's 100 years. If you're a bike rider, that's 100 miles, North Carolina. Um, I can't think of any other centuries right now. One cent is a penny, one hundredth of a dollar, right? So this word cent means 100. Um, basically, the backbone they describe a centurion of the Roman army. A centurion... Um, would have been the highest ranking non-commissioned officer. So like a sergeant, if you will, but they were in charge of about 100 men. It actually ended up being uh, 80. Historically, they said that 80 was kind of the number used. I'm not sure if it started at 100 and they kind of pared it down, but it's supposed to be about 100, but it was usually about 80 men. Um, in a town like Garrison, or Garrison, in a garrison like Capernaum, he would have been the ranking Roman officer. So he was a pretty important guy. Um, and if you think about living in Israel and being the face of the Roman Empire, what would people be thinking about this person? The, the Jewish people be thinking about this person? Threatened. Threatened. He's got this big falcatus sword on his belt that he's willing to use whenever he wants to, and he's able to do that. And what else? We know the Pharisees were always talking about, oh, we we're under the Roman thumb. When, oh, when will the Messiah be here to save us from these Roman scumbags, right? 
So Rome was oppressing the Israelites, and so this is the guy that was the face of that, that feeling of both fear and resentment. And um, this is the, the breakdown of the army, the Roman legion. Um, if you look at the legend, the small corner on the right there, on the left there, is one century of 80 soldiers. And they make further gatherings to make this collective legion. Um, you probably, if you've watched The Chosen, um, they've got a headdress like this on the centurion that's featured in that show. And it's historically correct. It had across the top of the head like a, like a C, sort of, in different colors to show their different orientation. But this is a centurion from the Roman army. So here's a centurion that's the face of the Roman government and and empire who's coming to Jesus, one of the subjugated people of Israel that he's heard about. Does that seem kind of strange to you in and of itself? It would to me. I mean, this is someone who's who's basically, you know, in, in charge. If you go through the New Testament... There are seven different centurions that are talked about in the New Testament. This is just one of them. Um, Can you think of any others just off the top of your head? I'm not going to ask for... Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. They had some key guarding positions a lot of times. It sure was. Yep, they were. The centurion was told to do certain things about, you know, he, he was like the, he had the sword. <laughs> so he was called upon to do all kinds of things like um, make someone carry a cross for, for Jesus. Um, in every case, despite the fact that there are this feared, resented person that we know historically, in every case, they're all viewed and the stories that we read about them in a very positive light. There's something positive about each of these stories of the centurions. None are negative. There's a couple where it doesn't really say much about, they don't have a key role, so they're, they're just kind of there. But all of them are a positive light and none negative, which is interesting. And the most positive I can think about was this one. From Acts 10, who was that? Cornelius, he was a centurion as well, with a name, and he became the first Gentile convert. So it's just kind of interesting. The one that we're reading about doesn't, is not given a name in the Matthew account or the other accounts. This particular story is also found in, in Luke as well, with some other details. Um, despite him being a Gentile, unclean, and none of these Israelites would have wanted to eat with this guy or be seen being too chummy with him. Despite that kind of a barrier between the peoples, he was regarded with gratitude and some respect. We just read in the story. Why was that? He built their synagogue? Hmm. Why would he have done that? It says he loved our nation, exactly. So he had a feeling for them. He had had a respect for their culture, perhaps. He had an understanding of their their customs. Enough so that he actually either had it built through channeling of funds or he paid for it himself. Usually these guys were wealthy and and powerful enough, they they could have made that happen. So Luke gives some more details there in chapter 7. Uh, verses 4 and 5 about that, the fact that he was the synagogue person. The centurion heard of Jesus, and recall, this is the guy who's the, the number one military and administrative person in Capernaum. So he's keeping a pulse, his finger on the pulse of everything going on. He heard about Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. So a little different take on how that happened. One mentioned the Sending and one said he went. 
when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So an interesting um, correlation, interesting um, connection of this man with the Jews. Surprising he knew of Jesus? Nope, he knew kind of everything was going on, but it was really still very unusual for a Roman to be getting into Jewish dealings as closely as this man had done, especially to try to petition to help um, in some way from a popular Jewish teacher that was very unpopular with the people that were in charge, the Pharisees. And he would have known that too, just from hearing about it. Now, does he actually make a request? Or what is the request he makes? In Matthew's account where he's actually speaking to Jesus, what's his, what's his request? Okay. Yep. But if you read through it carefully, he never says, please heal my servant. He just says, my servant's sick, say the word. That's how confident this man is in presenting his plea to Jesus. He doesn't even make a plea. He just says, fix it. Jesus, fix it. And he has that kind of confidence. I thought that was interesting if you, if you look kind of between the lines there on, on what's happening with it. Um, and I think this is a real good lesson for us when we're praying to God to have this approach, to have this in our mind, that number one, we have confidence in our Lord. Number two, we have a spirit of humility that this man had to lay it at his feet and what are we told what does Jesus say about prayer prayer of a righteous man availeth much yeah we're told pray with faith and confidence don't pray with a lack of confidence we're talking about our heavenly father who's given us everything, act like it and feel like it. So that's how we should pray. <clears throat> now, he was in a position where he could have, if he did, didn't think he was going to be successful, he could have bribed him, he could have coerced him. He had lots of weapons to <laughs> say, fix them or I'll, I'll make something bad happen. That wasn't his, uh, his, his position. So now let's look at the other side of the coin. He's been presented with this. Jesus has now been presented with this idea that here's a servant that is on death's bed, Luke says. He's about to die. But Jesus is talking to someone who's resented and feared amongst his people, even though he's acting nice and he's acting humble. But think about the, the potential ramifications of him getting involved in that. Just on a human standpoint, think about it. It wouldn't be a good position for most Jews to be in to say, yeah, I'm going to help out this Roman warrior. This is someone who's subjugated our country, taken over our, sacrificed pigs on some of our altars. Um, you know, things that they would consider really pretty dastardly, not to mention the hundreds and thousands of people that have been killed. So, if you think about the Jews' response to a Gentile like this, ceremonial washing is all about the unclean thing. And who was the unclean thing? The Romans. So what would the response be? Well, the story takes a little bit of a change, what you might expect. What kind of changes happen in this story that would surprise you at this point? Well, his response, he, he says, would you like me to heal him? He asks him that. But at this point, what does the centurion say? He calls him Lord. Yeah. And the Greek word there, kurios, is like spiritual master. It's not 
boss, its spiritual master. So he's professing faith in, in Jesus. But the twist I'm referring to is, sounds good so far. He's professing faith. Jesus is acting positive. And then the centurion almost tries to talk him out of it, it sounds like, doesn't it? He said, I, I can't even have you under my roof. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. This is coming from a pretty powerful guy in a pretty powerful position who has the right to do whatever he wants to do in this community. And he says, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. So when this happens, he then really shows his faith coming out when he says what? Just say the word, say the word. But it reminds us of 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the what? The humble. So this man is presenting a lot of, of important lessons for us. This Gentile, this man that does not know Jehovah, is knowing Jesus. And he's presenting some important lessons for how we then should live as well. And then he makes the greatest declaration of all when he says what? Just speak it. I know it will happen if you just speak it. Just say the word. And Jesus' response is amazement. How many times do we find Jesus being described as being amazed? Yeah, only two. And this is one of them. Um, the other time it's talked about is also a spiritual concern situation but it's just the flip side of the coin do you remember it um, actually no but that's a good good mention when he's actually teaching in the synagogue and the people in Nazareth his teenage hometown refuse to acknowledge it and he is amazed at their lack of unbelief. That's the other time that Greek word is used. So here, it's amazement at this Roman leader that's showing this kind of faith that he hasn't seen amongst his own people. So Jesus amazed. The idea that he's amazed just amazes me. Um, and especially when it's a matter of faith. And it makes me want to think, I want him to be amazed at me. If this Roman centurion can amaze Jesus with his faith, I want, I want Jesus to be amazed at me. Do you want that too? Think about that. Do I really want that? Am I willing to do what I need to do to make Jesus amazed at me? It's just a thought I thought about. Um, so, but at this moment though, like he oftentimes does, whether it be with his apostles, disciples, or just a teaching moment, he takes this moment to make a major spiritual point. Because of your belief, your faith is going to happen. And he talks about the greater picture of East and West. What was all that about? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Teresa. Yes. At whose table? Abraham. To the Jew, that's like saying, hey, you're in. You're in the club. You're, we're blood brothers. Yeah. Dan said that's the three fathers of the promises of the Israelites, and they'll be subject to the same blessings and everything else. And one of the blessings we're talking about here is being in the kingdom and being part of God's, God's nation. So on the basis of faith, not who you were born to, Jew or Gentile, you are invited. <clears throat> so Matthew 8, 
I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside. Who's that talking about? The Jews. This is sounding pretty, pretty ominous here. Not just left out to come in and get scraps later, thrown out into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That sounds a lot like other descriptions of hell, doesn't it? So pretty serious stuff here that Jesus is relating to the current Jews' approach to spiritual matters. And then Jesus says to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you, your faith had indicated, just as you believed it would happen, it'll be done. And then the story ends. Just kind of wraps it up in one nice little, you know, da da that's it. And it makes it so poignant, I guess, that Jesus just says the word and all it says is, and it was done. So the writer, Matthew writing this, is having the same response. The same, he's, he's feeling it, the same things that the centurion was feeling when Jesus just spoke the word and said, okay, go your way. Good point. John was saying that Jesus had the authority to make these things happen over distances, didn't have to be there, didn't have to wipe spittle on eyes. He didn't have to do any of those physical things, just had to make it happen. We know in Genesis, he was there for the beginning. The world and everything we see in it, the cosmos, was made through him. So he has control over all these things. It's not the end of our lesson, just the end of this segment. So lessons we can learn from this, um, number one, there's no incurables, right? Jesus healed everyone that came to him. And from a spiritual standpoint, today, there are no incurables. If you think you've sinned and you've gone too far, you haven't. That's the wonderful good news. That's what makes it not good news. Great news! (laughs) The gospel is great news because none of us have sinned irreparably. We're all made new when we have this faith of this centurion man that brought this, this need to Jesus. Another lesson, I think, is there are no specially privileged. Now, in this day and age, who is especially privileged? We can make a list. Give me some of the people on the list of the specially privileged here. The Jews, the Pharisees, the ones following the Old Testament laws. And then the guy with the falcata on his belt, he was pretty privileged, okay? High priest. High priest is one of those guys that's sort of above and beyond everybody else. Caesar himself, who they were required to worship, right, as Lord. So all these different people you might pull out and say, well, they, they've got special, no. Jesus says, from the east and from the west, all are invited. All you got to do is believe and have faith in me. Have faith in me and you're in, okay? So no specially privileged And your genealogy, if you will, does not secure heaven for anybody. doesn't matter where you were born or who to. How much you think about genealogy nowadays, right here at Lost River? What's that? Uncle Brian. Brian. (laughs) Mary said Uncle Brian. I had to chuckle when Taylor said that. What about when you, and I've said it, 
You've said it. Oh, yeah, Tim was raised in the church. I was raised in the church. What am I saying when I say that? It might be implied that I'm kind of already in the club because I've, I've been raised in the church. When I might not have any personal basis for that faith, but I've been around all my family who has faith and come to church every Sunday and I've been raised in the church. So Jesus is saying, that doesn't cut it. That doesn't secure you a place at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It doesn't. We don't have a genealogy we can look at and say, yep, that does it. And only faith in the Lord Jesus. Only faith in the Lord Jesus. I'll say it one more time. Only faith in the Lord Jesus. That's it. Doesn't matter. All these other things are just not to be counted for. And lastly, these statements that Jesus makes about weeping and gnashing of teeth, I'll use the word woe. Woe to them that trust in anything else. You've got no leg to stand on and you're facing a pretty ominous end. Okay? I don't want to be there. You don't want to be there. Let's not be there. And then lastly, the faithful centurion came very empty-handed. He didn't come. There's nothing he could give to Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of the universe. He came empty-handed and recognized that and came very humbly because of that and took him at his word. When Jesus said he's healed, turn, gone, end of story, and he was healed. Okay, we get to talk about another demoniac. <laughs> a demoniac. Um, if you're thinking about demons, and Sterling did a great job talking about the, the spiritual world, we can, we can talk a lot about demons, but a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to be speculative, right? Because the Bible doesn't give us a lot of information about this except to say that there are bad spirits. We know that. The powers and principalities of the world are not our friends. Satan is not our friend. But he's very much alive and well. And sometimes he's representing himself as what? Angels of light. Things that we would say, well, that's, not a, that's not a demon, that's not a devil. Um, could be. We don't know. And it's probably not a, a wise thing to be getting too much into speculative things about spirits, except to know that they are here. And Satan is an active being. It's not some cartoon creature and not something that's just, we read about in the Bible, and he's not active. We know that he's like a what? Like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So that's not something to play around with. And it's a real active ongoing thing. But if we start looking for speculative details, it is speculative detail. And we might get into trouble. So I, I would rather not do that myself. Um, the blind and mute demoniac. I'll keep saying that. Turn to Matthew 12. We'll read about this. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And once again, short and sweet, Jesus healed him. So that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said a strange thing. Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, ah, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Curious comment. Beelzebub. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. You can't see it too well. Down the lower corner, there's some, a bunch of flies. <clears throat> can anybody tell me about Beelzebub? It's another name for Satan. And... Master of the house. 
Yes. The, the book Lord of the Flies came from this name as well because there's another twist on the second part of that word that means master of the flies too. Um, I'm not sure how that works in there, but yeah. Um, so, you know, Beelzebub, evil spirit, Satan. And the Pharisees are claiming not he did that by some sleight of hand. He did that when we weren't looking. He wasn't really sick or blind, rather. He, they didn't make any of those kinds of excuses. They just said, we can't deny the miracle, but he did it by the power of Satan. Okay? Did it by the power of Satan instead. Um, can you think of some other times that this accusation has occurred against our Lord? It doesn't say anything here about Jesus addressing this accusation in Matthew 9. In Matthew 12, he responds and talks about an unpardonable sin. And also in Luke 11, responds and talks about the unpardonable sin. And we could talk about the unforgivable or unpardonable sin, but think about this. The Pharisees were saying he's doing this by Beelzebub, According to the Old Testament law, punishable by death. They're making a serious claim. They're not just saying he should be put in jail or given a fine or kicked out of town. They're saying he should be killed right now. So, a serious accusation. This unforgivable sin, I'll just just read this quote. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is unforgivable because it means denying Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And denying his gift of salvation. This is unpardonable because you are literally rejecting the only one who can save you. And I would agree with that comment. So we'll stop there. Um, um, I'll just mention they should have noted that this was a sign for them because exercising demons was a sign of the Messiah. We know from Genesis 3. Another overcoming the Satan like that. And that's a messianic title from Jeremiah 23. And the only other Old Testament character to have driven out a demon was David. So being the son of David was a link to that when they said, he just drove out a demon. Could this be the son of David? So thank you for your attention. I want to hear everybody use the word demoniac this week at least once. <laughs>